Welcome to Care Alive. I'm your host, Kara Pearson, and tonight's guest was the first African American woman to join the military. She became an, an attorney in Washington, D.C., and also an ordained minister. Yes, tonight we're speaking with Reverend Dovey Roundtree. Thank you, uh, Ms. Roundtree, for joining us again here on Care Alive. Thank you for having me. Uh, my grandfather, who was also a minister, always noted that you are a product of your upbringing. Uh, your grandfather was a minister here in Charlotte at East Stonewall. Could you tell us what your parents said to you or the values that they instilled in you during your upbringing? I think the key thing in my upbringing was prayer. Uh, we prayed. We prayed often in the morning, in the noon if we went home, but supper time, that was a big part of it. Sometimes we said Bible verses and were very quiet. Whatever your, your endeavor prior to the actual meal and the call to blessing had to cease as you went into prayer. And somehow, without even knowing it, you absorbed that atmosphere of prayer. And you, it became a part of you. Mm -hmm. And you did nothing without it. And having it, it somehow made everything different. Ours was truly a house of prayer. Neighbors came, people from the church came, there was always a word of prayer, either when they came or when they left. And that had a tendency to follow you mm -hmm. wherever you went and whatever you did. That there ought to be that quiet moment when you invoke the Almighty to come, be with you, share in whatever it was you were doing. I think that made a difference. And I believe in many of the homes, and they were Christians, church mm -hmm. members, mm -hmm. you had that same atmosphere. Mm -hmm. If you went to their homes to have a meal, it was there. Mm -hmm. God bless you was a sort of a byword. Mm -hmm. You're off to school. God bless you. I believe it made a tremendous difference in my life. My grandfather also noted that, and, and we did this too, uh, he said a family, a family that prays together stays together. So it was also a form in my own household and my upbringing too. It's uh, refreshing to hear you say that. Yes. Um, when you signed up for the Army in 1942 here in Charlotte, the sergeant uh, at that time tried to arrest you for enlisting. It is my understanding that Mary McLeod Bethune, and for those who are not familiar with her, is the founder of Bethune, Bethune Cookman College, and also the uh, National Council for Negro Women, yes. um, encouraged you to join the military and asked that you go to Richmond after uh, you were unsuccessful here in Charlotte. Could you tell me about your experience? Uh, I came down to Charlotte after the legislation was passed in Congress establishing the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps as it, was, as it was called at that time. I was given directions, you go to the U.S. Post Office. Mm -hmm. And I went and the, I presented myself and my little papers, my little pamphlets about the WAAAC. Mm -hmm. And he claimed that he didn't know anything about it. Well, I was excited. Undoubtedly, I spoke a little loud. And I told him, I know it is. I know it is. I have the papers. He wouldn't look at my papers and became very brusque with me. And he said, I should leave. And then another gentleman, uh, he was a military man. I assumed he was perhaps a lieutenant in mm -hmm. the back. And uh, he said, you have to get out of here. You're creating confusion in my office and so I quietly left. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not, and I want to correct that, uh, the first black okay. woman. There were, Dr. Bethune recruited 
39, I helped recruit 39 black women around the country. Mm -hmm. There were to be 440, and 40 would have been the 10% mm -hmm. or near, and they would be black, mm -hmm. who would be in the first officer candidate class of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, as we were then called. Uh, I, when I came home from my journey to the recruiting office, of course I was upset, and Mama was upset, mm -hmm. and we called Dr. Bethune. Mm -hmm. And I told her what my experience had been, that they didn't know anything about the whack down here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it's another world. Mm -hmm. She gave me directions. She said, well, come on back up to Washington. And then she asked, do you have any relatives in the North. I said, well, my sisters are in New York. I have two there. And um, I have other people. And I ha and Mama said, well, you have your cousins in Richmond mm -hmm. on Amanda's children, because she had passed on. I said, well, I'll go up to Richmond. She said, now do that. And I gave her the address. And she said she'd send me some of her papers there, okay. 502 South Harrison Street. I went back in a few days to Richmond. I went there. and. Allie Lowry, who was my cousin, mm -hmm. made arrangements to take me to the U.S. Post Office the next day. And we went. And strangely, we were welcomed. It was if they knew <laughs> I was coming. Uh -huh. And you heard the song, if I'd known you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. Uh -huh. Well, I had it, sort of had that sensation. Uh -huh. But they let me fill out my papers. They made appointment for my physical and mental exam on a day very soon thereafter. And I was off and running. <laughs> in, a, in a week's time, I was pretty well set. I had taken my mental alertness. Mm -hmm. I had take, uh, completed my physical. Mm -hmm. There was some question about my eyes. I, I've had a little difficulty with my eyes since mm -hmm. I was a baby. In any event, in another 10 days, I received a telegram mm -hmm. giving me a time and date to report mm -hmm. to the post office. And I would be leaving at that time. Oh. Yes, I, so I had to get all my little things together, such as I had, mm -hmm. and get ready and the whole household, Lowry ha household, Bessie, uh, and uh, the others assembled and escorted me to the post office. And there was a large group of white girls, I'd say about a dozen, mm -hmm. but they, they had already been processed even as I had been. Mm -hmm. And later on that afternoon, the train came, and we all got on the segregated train. <laughs> so you were in the back, and they were in the front, or how was well, the, the train uh, situation? We were traveling first class, so as, as first class transportation does sometimes not lend itself to full segregation, mm -hmm. uh, I was in the last compartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was so excited and so frightened. But for a time there, I was really frightened. Mm -hmm. That here, here it is, what am I doing? Where am I going? <laughs> Why am I going? Did you realize the historical significance at that time? Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> oh, no, no. It had nothing to do with history. It had something to do with me leaving home and going and not going to <laughs> medical school as I thought I would be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it meant to me, mo mainly. But the girls were friendly, some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to know about me, and I, in turn, wanted to know about them. There, there were some who had finished college, some who had not, and, and we were able to talk very casually. The next morning, we were in Chicago. We were transferred to a lot on, uh, one of those fast tra Western trains who, that took us to Fort Des Moines, not to Des Moines Highway. And the big trucks met us mm -hmm. in our little bags and our little wild eyes. We, <laughs> we boarded the bus that took us to Fort Des Moines. Oh. For the first time, I was apprehensive. I was frightened. I thought to myself, what in the world? Why am I here? Mm -hmm. Too late. <laughs> You're already there. I'm there. <laughs> and of course, things moved fast. We were assigned uh, with the other girls that were there, black girls, who one company. Uh, and we were the, um, we had a small, smaller company than some of the others. But we were attached to a regiment of, of white girls, mm -hmm. and we marched together. We would tail in. We went into the dining room. We went to the health uh, when we went to get uh, health services. And 
It moved along, and the next thing you know, we were attending officer candidate class. And we were told only a few of us would graduate. And you know what that would do to a group of women, don't you? Mm -hmm. the, the competition, you could sense it in <laughs> our step. And then later they changed and said, those who pass will be commissioned. Okay. Yeah. What, what did your parents think about that? That was very revolutionary, I guess, so to speak, for that time that period. Was, <laughs> yes, it was. My grandmother was excited because she was daring. Mm -hmm. Grandma had a French and Indian and black background. Mm -hmm. She was thrilled to death. Mama was a little, after all, I'm her child. <laughs> uh, she was a little apprehensive. She wanted to be sure I could get out if I wanted to get out. Well, I, that never crossed my mind. If I'm going into it, I'm going into it to get my commission and do what you do in the military. Mm -hmm. And that was what I did. It was exciting. A strange uh, thing, my first military assignment was Charlotte, North Carolina. So you were back. As a recruiting <laughs> and induction officer. Oh, how I ironic. I came <laughs> with... Uh, Colonel Ruth Lucas. She stayed in and not too long ago retired as a colonel. We came here together to start the recruiting in the 4th Service Command. And we went all over. We went to Rolla. We went to Durham. We went to Atlanta. We went all around. And it was just such excitement. <laughs> such excitement. Uh, we looked pretty good in the uniform. I think the uniform <laughs> became us a little more than perhaps if our skin had been fairer. Mm -hmm. And people noted, I've been trying to find for you an article and some pictures that were taken by the, a reporter for the Charlotte News. It was a little paper. Uh -huh. And it was distributed every day in the afternoon. She caught us on the square, the two of us, walking along in cadence. Mm -hmm. And uh, she took pictures. And she interviews. I haven't been able to find it. I have a librarian who's trying to help me. Oh, okay. I'd like to have that for my own book that I hope will be coming out next year. Okay. And what will be the name of that book since you're uh, on that topic? This is my story. This is my song. Oh, I like That's that. That's Grandma's favorite hymn. <laughs> she sang it all the time. In tune or out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> Go, going back in time again, uh, as a member of the Women's Army Corps, you became captain. Yes. And you had a double whammy being a woman and being African American. Uh, what was it like for an African American woman for that time period just to be in the arm, army or well, military? Well, there were those who laughed. There were those who saw you as a sex symbol. But some of the teaching of Dr. Mary McClune, Kyle Bethune, made a difference, I believe, to all of us who were in that first class. She was a part of the advisors who from time to time came to Port Des Moines during our training. Mm -hmm. And she made it known to us that we not, were not there to fight but one war, and that was World War II. And the other war, she said, I, Mary McLeod, I'm taking care of that. <laughs> and I will be at your side. And I want you to be proud women. I mm -hmm. want you to be smart women. I want you to know the army, just like any man would know. And I want to disabuse your minds if anyone thinks you're some kind of sex thing out here. Mm -hmm. And that was the rumor that we were going to go to Wachuca, and a large number did go to Wachuca later on. And you would serve the men sexually. Well, mm -hmm. first, there was always such a few of us. We would have had an awesome time trying to satisfy all men, and particularly black men, in the service. Mm -hmm. And that was just a thing that, that soon slid away, slithered away like the ugly things that slither. Mm -hmm. And we went on in service assignments in this country and abroad. I did not go abroad, but there was a, a, a um, male battalion, okay. M-A-I-L, that did go and served with distinction under the uh, uh, leadership of Colonel Charity Edna Adams. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think our service very soon, the measure of it, the dedication of it, and let me hastily say, some women died in action, a truck turned over and oh, various okay. things. 
So we were not, just not there looking pretty. Okay. In recent years, I have uh, interred the remains of several wax, one of whom uh, uh, was uh, in my class. Mm -hmm. And I always feel, and I always, when I'm at Arlington, feel a little uplifted that you got some angels here. <laughs> There's some women who serve this country. And I think we play it lightly. Our communities don't really seem sometimes to grasp it. Mm -hmm. But it was significant. As Mrs. Bethune said to us one day, she came and was sitting on the foot locker and talking to us as she loved to do. She should have been the whack number one. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, uh, you are here and all of the generations of black women from slavery on are also here in your minds and in your heart. You are marching here that they may march because they have marched before you and made the sacrifice. As you by now know, I loved and adored Dr. Bethun. Oh, yeah, I can tell. Yeah, 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 she, I could just, you know. <laughs> she lifted me mm. and made me think there were things that I needed to do other than the things that I was dead-headed to do. Oh, me, how I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. When she got hold of me when I came out of the service, she sent me to the West Coast talking about FEPC, fair employment, and other things and to build a consciousness that women submerge. We have it. Mm -hmm. We submerge it. We think it takes away our femininity or blah, 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 mm -hmm. whatever else. And she made me know a smart woman, a smart woman, a godly woman, God can use mm -hmm. as he had used her. I spoke uh, in October at Bethune-Cookman Founders Day. What a thrill with all the students there in mm -hmm. the new auditorium. I had been there in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Right after I got my captaincy, I w came to the Founders Day. Mrs. Roosevelt spoke. Mm -hmm. She was on one end of the platform. I was in the middle and Mrs. Bethune was on the other. Oh. And Mrs. Bethune, you know, had a little asthma thing, and she began to call. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't really know what to do, Mrs. Roosevelt got up, walked back, poured the water, walked back around, and stood there while Mrs. Bethune drank the water. I don't know why that so impressed me, but I've told it many, many places. Mm -hmm. It showed me the measure of their relationship because they were working together in behalf of people and most especially in behalf of black women. Mm -hmm. And I came to know Mrs. Roosevelt and to just, you know, just said, oh my goodness, I have to do something. I have to be a part. And sometimes I get fearful that we lose that. Maybe we lose it because we do a lot of it in the church. I know in my church, mm -hmm. women are always at the forefront doing something to make life better for black people. Mm -hmm. And all people, because if you make life better for me, it's better for everybody. That, that's, that's my co concept of what we have to do in a young person like you. <laughs> or oh, I marvel that you're here and doing what you're doing. And let me say you may not think so, but we need it. The world needs it. The mm -hmm. world needs it. Imagine we are going into 2000, we have not had even a woman vice president. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about a president. I'm talking about a vice president. Mm -hmm. You were just noting, too, you were saying that uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, instilled in you uh, the value of becoming a smart woman mm -hmm. and, and spiritual. Mm -hmm. uh, after you finished the military, mm -hmm. you attended school, I guess, yes. at that time. Could you tell me where you did your undergraduate studies? Oh, I did my undergraduate study before I went into the okay. military at Spelman College. I graduated from there in 1938. Okay, and then after and that, and when I came out of service, I went back to Washington under the wings of Dr. Bethune. Okay. And um, I was, I, I had hoped to be able to enter medical school. Okay. That was my goal. Being around Mrs. Bethune in her office and meeting the various leaders, Walter uh, uh, Granger, Walter White, 
uh, and many of the other ministers and leaders, she would introduce all of us, all of us said, you know, she never let any of them come in that she didn't. Mm -hmm. But she began to talk to me about why you have to be a doctor. <laughs> well, I made A in biology and I thought I was pretty smart about the human body. And that just had fixed in my mind, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be a doctor. She took me to an affair at Howard University and I met Dr. Johnson, who was dean of the law school. I met Dr. Nabrit, James Nabrit, who became president mm -hmm. and whose father's church I attended when I was in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I began to think about it. I got some literature about it. And then she had Mrs. Frances Sampson from Chicago. She was at one point the, uh, a representative of the United Nations. Okay. She was a black woman lawyer. When I was introduced to her and we started bantering around with conversation, I knew then I wanted to be like Miss Sampson. I wanted to be a lawyer. When she, uh, the tales that she told me just made my <laughs> head go. It was the most exciting thing. And it was the first time I had ever really been in the presence of a woman lawyer, a black woman lawyer. Wow. I shudder when I think of how few opportunities some of our girls have now. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about women in space, but we got almost nine women, black women in the space, mm -hmm. doing that thing and doing it very well. I included in all of my messages, and I hope some girl will pick it up. And I tell them, if you don't know where to write, see me. We must miss out on space. Mm -hmm. People, my grandson is going to be living in those shuttles, in those apartments, working in space. James Andrew Pritchett, along with hundreds of others. But we can't keep it quiet. It shouldn't be a secret. <laughs> Do you know around this country every summer they have little units and they set up a space center and they bring in children and they study during the summer. If they didn't do it this summer, it'd be the first time in a few years they haven't. Mm -hmm. I have written at least one letter. I want to get an answer. I'm going to write Mr. Clinton. I think that must include black children. Mm -hmm. Maybe it does. I don't know it. My community doesn't know <laughs> it. You see, mm -hmm. it's a secret. And when it gets to be a secret, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. You're missing life. I'm worried about that incident. <laughs> the future of uh, our people? In space. In space. Because that's the next, that's it. There are people out there now. We are not, although quite a number of black men have been on the cruise, I'm sure there, there may have been at least one, maybe three women, black women, but you've never seen any in Charlotte. There's been no affair here that featured astronauts, black women astronauts in particular. You know of any? No, I no. don't. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? That's a shame. That's a sin to little girls who are nine and 10 today. Mm -hmm. so you've got to have some vision and you get your vision from what goes on, on around you. Mm -hmm. I'm a star watcher. I study the planets. I've got all kind of books on it. You can see planets with your naked eye. Of mm -hmm. course, as blind as I am, you can't. <laughs> but there are, I'm sure, some telescopes around. I know down at the University of North Carolina, nobody Duke, there must be some. You know of anybody taking a pilgrimage to take kids to see through and see the planets? No, I don't, but they oh. have the, the planetarium where I'm from, which is in uh, Ro Robeson County. Oh, they do? Yeah, and uh, as a youngster, they did take us uh, once delighted. a year for each class. I'm year, delighted. So, so there was such a type of uh, program that was going on. I don't know about Mecklenburg County, though. I don't know then, anyone. I looked in the, you know, <laughs> I looked in the yellow page. Well, I want you to give me the address of the one you know. Okay, I, I will do because that. Because I really want to be on the roll there. <laughs> and I want other families, black and white, mm 
mm -hmm. to go and take the children. Otherwise, we're going to miss a whole age. Other countries are doing that, and the children involved. Yeah, that and the uh, computers, too. Oh, and the computer. Well, <laughs> to get into space, you better know computers. Exactly. Have computers. <laughs> Uh, changing the subject just a bit, mm -hmm. um, as you worked as an attorney in a, uh, Washington, D.C. for yes. 51 years. 51 years. And you represented, one of your cases was uh, Sarah Keyes. Yes. And Sarah Keyes was the lady who was forced to give up her bus seat to a white Marine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noted that this case led to the desegregation of travel across state lines. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about that case and your experience with that? Yes. I am delighted that Frank Reeves, who was with the NACP in Washington, referred her to me. The NACP, I guess with all of its load of cases, decided that it would fan that case out when she and her father came to Washington to make a complaint. I um, interviewed her and heard all the details and had to resist being angry but because she was in uniform. But the bus driver made a distinction. Mm -hmm. You're black and in a uniform, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. You're white and you're male and you're in uniform, that's still another thing. Mm -hmm. But when I took my oath, uh, it involved, and it, for her too, serving this country. Mm -hmm. And that's what she was doing. Okay. We went to court. We filed a civil suit mm -hmm. in U.S. District Court. Mm -hmm. And the, one afternoon, the judge called us in, and he heard my arguments that it was a violation of the Commerce Clause mm -hmm. and all the bad things that went along with doing that, and especially to one in uniform. Mm -hmm. That kind of got him. It kind of set him back. But he ruled, went right on and ruled that he had no jurisdiction, that the state of North Carolina could make and should make its own laws with respect to travel, mm -hmm. bus travel. And he could therefore, he said, Ms. Roundtree, I really feel, you know, very bad about it, that she had this experience, but there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And shrug his shoulders. <laughs> well, we went to the ICC, which is down on uh, Constitution Avenue, mm -hmm. and we talked to the clerk. They gave us some literature, rules and regulations. We didn't tell him exactly what our concern was. Mm -hmm. We went back to the office, my partner, who is now deceased, Julius Robinson, mm -hmm. and we got out the books and we worked pretty much all night long. And we came with the conclusion we should file before the ICC. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to interrupt you. We're going to have to close up in a second. Uh, right. We had such a great conversation here, and yeah. I know we could, get, could go on all night right. with this. Um, but I wanted to know, just so people would know more about you and, and your history, um, I have this book here and that you were so kind to bring in regards to another case that she had worked on, which was the uh, Mary Myers case, uh, which was um, Kennedy's um, mistress, a very private woman. Um, and he's trying to get a close-up on that now. Again, I want to thank you guys for joining us here on Carol Live with Dovey Roundtree, Reverend Dovey Roundtree. Yes. And it has been a, indeed a pleasure having her here. Uh, hope to have her again because I had a whole lot more I wanted to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, you can email us at carolive at usa.net or hit us on our webpage at members.tripod.com, Carol Live. Thanks again for watching Carol Live.